if you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf betting system Greetings and welcome to the returning Golf Betting System podcast. It's episode 331. This is our 2024 Abu Dhabi HSBC Championship plus Worldwide Technology Championship Tips podcast. Barry O'Hanran and Paul Williams join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss our selection for this week's PGA Tour and DP World Tour action. Good morning, gents. Morning, guys. Morning, guys. Visit our world-famous golf betting system website where we have in-depth betting previews for both events. We've got Yas Link's Abu Dhabi strokes gained rankings, form stats, plus, of course, new and old predictor models. For all of the golf action this week, our content is available across both events, completely free of charge. There is no paywall. On X, you can follow Barry at A Good Talk Golf. Paul is at Golf Betting. I am at Bamford Golf. Subscribe to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where this podcast is available each and every week. Throw us a like whilst you're listening. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. As ever, for those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. Of course, if you're listening on Spotify, press that five-star button. It's two seconds worth. Now, this one's entitled, Worth a Listen, Five Stars. It's very short and sweet. It's from David Chelsea, uh, Chesley, and David's in the United States of America. Best jingle of all golf betting podcasts and entertaining hosts sharing stats and wearing their emotions on their sleeves, all mixed together for a great weekly listen. David, thank you for your five-star review. Much appreciated. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Now, can you um, remember two weeks ago? Because I know that Paul, you've been uh, you, you've been on a, on a, a bit of a travel, and I've been on my travels. All I can remember is Ricky Fowler did give me an each way return at the Zozo. He did, yeah. He did indeed. Um, I can I can I can also safely say that Nico Echeverria at two hundred and fifty to one. <laughs> Was not on my shortlist. No, not on the, not on a great deal of people's shortlists. I wouldn't have thought of that price, but uh, yeah, managed to managed to hold everyone else off, didn't he? Yeah, second uh, second PGA Tour win now for Echeverria as well. Yeah, was per, was it Puerto Rico the first? It's I think so. Or Corrales. Yeah. It was one of the one of the alternates from memory, but yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as, once you get into that multiple winner status, you're you're elevating yourself up the uh, up the rankings a little. So clearly knows how to get the job done when it presents itself to him. <laughs> yeah, he's like Ted Potter Junior. for um, <laughs> old style listeners, isn't he? You're one of your favourite ever uh, golfers, Paul. He's one of those where. They get into contention like once a year, but they're absolutely one hundred percent converters. Mm. Your Jim Hermans, the Hermanator. Yeah. yeah, yeah. String of missed cuts, and then uh, bang, away you go. Wins at some obscene price. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an art, isn't it? It's, it's a skill that some golfers seem to have, and many others simply don't. What happened over in uh, on the DP World Tour? That was the Genesis Championship in South Korea, wasn't it? And we had a... <laughs> I can remember on the last pod saying at some point that, you know, I would never back Ben Arn at single digits, a guy that never wins a golf tournament. Mm. And he so, wins. So he goes and wins well, yeah, from I mean, Tom Kim. Yeah, and it ended up in a playoff between the, the two favourites, effectively. So... If you'd have gone down the route of backing the favourites, dutching the favourites potentially, then it would have been a pretty comfortable playoff. But, you know, I'm not going to beat myself up over missing Benny Ann. That was his first 
DP World Tour win since Wentworth back in 2015. So, you know, nine years or more than nine years since his last win. And you're backing him at, what, eight, nine to one? I just, yeah, it, it, it wasn't for me. Um, those two were the best two players on the week. And, and, and you know, in the end, it, it, it was settled between them and extra holes. But... Yeah, disappointing for me. Brandon Stone I had each way. He tied for ninth in that kind of dead zone as a punter. Marcel, Marcel Schneider was a shot further back. So both of them with a good final day could have uh, produced enough each way money to offset, you know, a, a, a single digit winner. But uh, yeah, both kind of just plodded along to a final day. You know, solid position, but... Uh, but certainly not paying out from an each way perspective. So we live to fight another day, Steve. I had Nikolai Hoygaard. He was uh, tied ninth as well. Yep. Indeed. All good fun. Right. Shall we go get straight on to this week's action? I thought we'd mm. start with the playoff event on the DP World Tour. Yep. The very discreetly named Abu Dhabi HSBC Championship. Mm, yes. Big on the Yas Lynx golf course. Over to you, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, a new spot in the schedule, actually, isn't it, for the Abu Dhabi Championship? It used to be early season, one of the Rolex Series events right at the beginning of the uh, year in the Middle East swing, but... Yeah, now it's the hors d'oeuvres to next week's uh, finale over at the Earth Course for the DP World Tour Championship. So we've got a 70-man field, no cut. Top 50 in the Race to Dubai rankings will then go through to next week's final, as I say, over at the Earth Course where the Race to Dubai winner will be crowned. Um, It looks, for all intents and purposes, like it's going to be Rory McIlroy. He's 1,500 points ahead at the moment. Um, so it's pretty much a done deal. Bar it, he'd have to have two pretty disastrous weeks by Rory's standards not to top the rankings at the end of uh, end of next week. Um, he can virtually get it done this week should he, should he win or be very, very close. So, and, you know, Rory doesn't tend to finish much outside the top, you know, half dozen at best mm. or at worst. So um, it it seems like a bit of a damp squib, the actual race to Dubai, but that doesn't take away from what is an excellent tournament this week and, of course, what will be an excellent tournament next week over in Dubai. In terms of the betting for this week, uh, Rory is the favourite. Five to one he was pushed out to. There's a little bit of sixes if you take the um, absolute bog standard each way terms, but generally fives, nine to two, something like that. Till Hatton thirteen to two, Tommy Fleetwood eight to one, Joaquin Neiman twelve to one, Shane Lowry being backed in fourteen to one now for Shane Lowry. Uh, great field: Rasmus Hoygaard, Bob McIntyre twenty twos, Adam Scott, Jorbjorn Olsen, Minwoo Lee twenty five to one, thirty to one. Bar those players, so plenty of good quality names uh, to contend with this week. Only a 70-man field, as I say, but there are some good each-way terms out there. Boyle Sports, Labbrooks, Coral, all of them gone eight places each way, a fifth of the odds as standard. Bet365, Bet Fred, both have each-way options up to uh, up, up to and beyond eight places each way. Depends how you want to cut your cloth this week. So, as I say, in a 70-man field, when you're getting eight places or beyond then uh, it does give you lots of options and lots of opportunities to make a few quid. Of course, as you go down the list here this week, the prices do get much, much deeper than those that I've mentioned, but uh, certainly a few at the top that the bookies are taking very few chances on. I was trying to think the last time on the DP World Tour that Rory McIlroy would be so closely challenged by someone other than John Rahm. In the betting market, mm. yeah, yeah, it's a fair point. He's uh, it's a very tight gap, isn't it, between him yeah, and Hatton? Yeah, and you know Hatton's coming off the back of that win at the Dunhill Links um, mm. in some decent form. Rory, you know, despite it, what I said a, a few minutes ago about him being always in and around the lead, it 
just isn't converting at the rate that you would want to see for a player that you're potentially backing at five to one. And you know, if you if you get a fifth of the odds, five to one, yeah, I, you, you could tenuously argue that you could you could do a kind of a, a shot to nothing each way. But um, yeah, it's uh, not the kind of way I'd play it personally. But yeah, it's, it, there's um, you know there's, there's challenges there. Tommy Fleetwood generally. Eight to one. I've seen him as short as six to one. So there's um, you know, there's, there's plenty of people who think that Tommy's got a chance again this week. Plenty of the yeah. bookies that do. Um, again, does he win enough to justify backing at that kind of kind of price? That's interesting with Unibet, isn't it? Nine to two, they go McElroy. Thirteen to two, Hatton. Six to one, Fleetwood. I mean, that is tight as you like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're they're making a, a flat fleet with the second favourite rather than Hatton, which is yeah. a, which is little against the grain compared to the other bookies. But <clears throat> yeah, to your point, um, yeah, very very rare do you see, you know, it's like, it's either Scheffler and Rory or Rory and Rahm, depending on the tournament who at the top. But uh, a trio this week. In terms of the course, from memory, we're talking past Barlam. Is that right? Hmm. Yep, yeah, Paspalum from tee to green. It's a 7,425-yard par 72. It's designed by Kyle Phillips. So when you think Kyle Phillips, you think Lynx generally, you think uh, Kings mm. Barnes, uh, Bernardus Golf, Verdure over in Sicily, a few others that have uh, been dotted around on the DP World Tour schedule. And this is described as um, a modern Lynx. It's a modern imitation of a Lynx, effectively. There are exposed fairways. There's fescue. There's pot bunkers. As you say, perspalum used from tee to green. But, um, yeah, in a lot of ways, it's, it's it's a more typical desert, exposed desert kind of track, I guess. A typical 36-36 setup. So you've got four par fives, a couple of short par fours that start each of the rounds, and then... As the nines, um, as you're getting deeper into the nines, they get a little bit tricky, or trickier at least. Now we've got a couple of years of data worth considering if you're flicking through the stats pages this week. So, 2022, 2023 are the relevant results in terms of Yas Links. Prior to that, we played this exclusively over at the Abu Dhabi Golf Club for a number of years, 16 years, I think it was. So. Prior to 2022, um, do take those results with a pinch of salt. 2022, though, was Thomas Peters. He won at 10 under par, 40 to 1. Last year, Victor Perez, 18 to 1, 55 to 1. I was on Perez that week. It was a very nice start to the 2023 season with him chipping in, holding his bunker shot on the 71st hole it was to uh, set himself up for victory that uh, that week. Hopefully a repeat performance from one of my guys this week. That'd be nice. Um, it was much windier in 2022. Now, that kind of explains the winning score, 10 under, as I say, versus 18 under. And I'm not expecting it to be anywhere near as tough as the 2022 renewal this year. It looks like it's going to be dry, sunny, highs in the kind of high 80s maybe touching 90 degrees fahrenheit so you know in and around 30 centigrade that kind of number um 10 to 15 mile an hour in the afternoons maybe it may pick up to that kind of rate but in the mornings it should be pretty calm so i'm expecting it to be much more like the 2023 edition where high teens wins this under par rather than um, rather than a grind which it proved to be back in 22 now if you dig through the stats and we've got full stats for for both events um both winners they both hit around about 70 percent of fairways so that put them around the top 10 on the field or in the field that particular week both hit around about 80 percent of greens but there's little variation in greens hit here it's the greens are quite large so you don't have a massive variation lots of players in the 70s and 80s in terms of percentage of greens and regulation so it then comes down to how the course plays and how players perform on and around the greens and in a tougher renewal back in 2022 Thomas Peters he led the scrambling stats that was a tough year um last year Victor Perez was second for putts per greens and regulation so when he was hitting the greens which was with regularity 
he was then making the second most amount of putts during the course of the week. So putting was pretty key for Perez. In terms of strokes gained, strokes gained off the tee was pretty strong for both. Well, very strong for both, in fact. Peters was second for strokes gained off the tee. Perez was third. Tee to green. Peters was uh, first for strokes gained tee to green. Perez was 11th. Um, the difference, again, when it was easier last year, was certainly on and around the greens. Victor Perez, third for strokes going around the green, fifth for strokes going putting. I think, personally, that's the kind of combination. Those are the kind of metrics that you're likely to see from the winner here this week. The par fives, when it plays um, a little easier, um, are much more attackable, much more scorable. And I think this week that uh, par five scoring equally will be pretty important I think you're going to need to be in the kind of 10 under bracket or deeper in terms of par 5 scoring if you're going to be standing a chance of winning this golf tournament this week Um, in terms of incoming form I mean if you, if you dig through the history of course we've got um, all of the old Abu Dhabi championship um, course form as well prior to that but in terms of um, winners at this event, everyone going back to the very start had a top 12 finish in one of their last four starts. So every single winner. So if you're trying to kind of chop the field down a little bit to start with, then uh, take a look at your players' performances over their last four starts. Um, you could get as brutal as cut, putting a knife to everyone who hasn't got a top 12 finish. Um dangerous game of course because trends do get beaten but I do like the, someone coming in with a bit of form Peters and Perez both of them had a top 15 on their very last outing and um, of course both had their top 12 win their last four as well so current form's good um, both of them had a top two finish at the Abu Dhabi Golf Club before winning here at Yas Links as well so some decent form in the desert isn't a bad starting points either anyway i've back for this week um i've got a couple of relatively short that i'll bring you guys in um if you look through the winners here or you look through the players that haven't won historically it's been a bit of a graveyard for favorites over the years and as we said we've got three players here this week who are all single digits um with that with the fact that the race to dubai is going to be a bit of a damp squib this year, um, yeah. Uh, barring something mad happening over uh, over this week and next, then I, I think it just opens the door a little bit for players in that kind of second tier of the betting and beyond to to go through and uh, and win this golf tournament. And for me, by far my favourite bet of the week um, is Nikolai Hoygaard. Now you're still getting right now forty to one. I when he when he first um appeared on some of the early books yesterday mm -hmm. uh, he was popping up around about 25 to 1 and so i was thinking well you know maybe maybe we'll get a little bit longer than that some real disparity though the book is popping up with 50 to 1 bet fred opened at 55 to 1 with their standard each way terms and hoy mm. uh whereas others have stuck pretty rigidly to this kind of 25 28 to 1 number um I don't mind a bit of disparity about a player in terms of the pricing. It kind of gives the impression that players or, or bookies really are unsure as to, to what his chances are. And for me, I think he's got a far better chance, particularly than some of those early prices, the 50s and the, the 45s that are out there. There's still 40 to 1 available right now as we're recording this. This is 7.45am on Tuesday morning. Um, I suspect he'll continue to be backed, but uh, if you do fancy a bit of Nikolai, there's, um, there's some good pricing out there, I think. And I think if someone's going to beat the market leaders, then... He's going to have to be a special kind of talent. And we've seen with Nikolai that he's got previous on that count. He's, he's won the DP World Tour Championship last year. He held off a fantastic field over there at the Earth Course. Pretty kind of so-so year this year over in the US. But he's come back to Europe to attempt to qualify um, for Dubai once again so he can defend his title for, for next week. Yeah. And... Uh, as you said, you know, you backed him at the Genesis. He needed a good result at the Genesis. He finished ninth, which just about snuck him inside the top 70 for this week. Yeah. He sits 67th at the moment, but he's got to get himself inside the top 50 so that he can even tee it up next week over at the Earth Course. 
And, Interestingly uh, enough, Easter. Paul, as well, he's 55th in the official World Golf Rankings. So we Absolutely. know top 50, master start in 2025. He's got a lot to play for. So it won't surprise listeners to hear that I've uh, I've joined your Nikolai Hoygaard. It's, uh, at the price, is a great bet, I think. I, going going to, your, to your point about the World Rankings, um, as you said, if he gets in the top top fifty, opens loads of doors, doesn't it? Yep. Um, for year end masters. Now he finished sixteenth at Augusta last year. Yep. One shot away from the top twelve, which would have automatically provided him with an invite for twenty twenty five. So he just right. missed out by by one shot. Mm. So you know he's, he's he's got that to resolve, and um, he could do it in one fell swoop this week. Get himself inside the top fifty with a win here, and um, jobs are good. And yeah. Uh, Tenth year last year, first for strokes gain off the tee. Sorry, first for strokes gain tee to green, second for strokes gain off the tee. Absolutely stone cold putter uh, over well here at Yas Links twelve months ago. Last time out at the Genesis, gained more than well nearly four strokes putting during the course of the four days. So positive strokes gain putting for me, it all adds up. I think is um, for for me, it's the better the week. Absolutely better the week. So. Um, as I say, 40 to 1 still available right now. The other one I've backed, relatively short prices, and, and I've kept the faith with Thjorbjorn Olesen at uh, 25 to 1 with the extended eight place options out there. Now, I've backed Thunderbear <laughs> back at the. <laughs> back you love at it. The op- yeah, I, I, I can think of some other uh, nicknames, but then they're, they're not. Uh, Broadcastable, I suppose, but no, he, he, he. I backed him back at the uh, Open de France. He um, he fell just one short, didn't he? It was a shot short of Dan Bradbury. He didn't get the breaks on the Sunday that Dan did, and um, just couldn't quite get himself that one extra shot, which would have given him a chance at the playoff. But uh, he followed it up with seventh at the Andalusia Masters, up to eighteenth in the race to Dubai. Now, just a, two or three places outside of those PGA Tour card positions again and uh, I'm sure he'll be looking to bounce straight back to the PGA Tour so big incentive for him 42nd and 20th here at Yas Links from the two years that he has played he won the Razel Khaimah Championship earlier this year so um, got some form in the Middle East a similar run of form he was on coming into that as well so kind of one of those players that can telegraph a win with um, you know some good upcoming form won the Daniel Links back in 2015 too which um, could correlate nicely of course Victor Perez who won here last year had also won the Dunhill Links back in 2019 it was fifth for par five par five scoring on the season second for strokes game putting lots to like with Dior Bjorn Olison for me this week well let's bring you guys in um, Barry you got any 50 to 1 or shorter that you fancy this week <laughs> Well, we're we're all rowing together now with Hoygaard. It's just a really good bet, um, mm. compelling, compelling case. And I'm not I'm not going to fight Janet, so I just threw the money on it. Didn't didn't bother doing much more research. It it makes an awful lot of sense. So yeah, I'm I'm there with you on him. Um, I'm going to keep the faith and roll the dice again with Jordan Smith. Hopefully, just it gets the decent putter going this week. Um, Playing very well the last couple of months, so mm. uh, he'll probably just do the consistent thing and finish eighth or something like that. But um, one outside the place of Borsi, <laughs> and after that, I'm out to the outsiders. So I'm going to go back to Jeff Winter again. Okay, just picking on that vibe where the you know he can the wind the wind is not going to be up this week, so his lack of length shouldn't hurt him too much and uh, just let him put the lights out. Mm. Yep. Tasty price. We went to, I was looking at him yesterday. Solid three figure chance across the board, really. Mm. Yeah. Very, very good. The other other angle we haven't mentioned here is Ryder Cup points. Yeah. There's going to be a barrel load of Ryder Cup points here. And it's, you Mm -hmm. know, now that we know that the Ryder Cup is only, they're basically saying to the Europeans, didn't they? You know, play play over here in the uh, in the autumn, and we get the Ryder Cup up and running. I've got a sneaky feeling, you know, that Matt Wallace is going to play well. Yep. No, I get that. The reason I like Matt Wallace is 
he tends to telegraph with a previous outing where his game's at. And the thing that was noticeable at Andalusia a couple of weeks ago was he only finished 20th, but he was 10th for off the tee for strokes gained, 13th for approach, and 9th for tee to green. Stone, cold, putter. He was mm. literally 60th in the field. He was losing over half a stroke per round with the putter. So, yeah, Matt Wallace, i got a sneaky feeling that he's going to go well. And if my memory serves me right, the first victory he had in the, P- the, uh, on the, in the States on the PGA Tour was on a Passport Harlem golf course. I'm just looking it up quickly because my brain's gone blank. Yeah, he won the Corrales Punta Cana in 2023. Yeah. And guess who yeah. he beat? Nikolai Sammy Hoygaard. Was it Nikolai Hoygaard? Yeah. <laughs> the listeners can't tell right now, but you can if you really go close, you can hear the fear in Paul's voice with everything he'll say <laughs> for the next few minutes. How close was Wallace for you? Were you was he on yeah, your shortlist? I- yeah, I'm I'm still reeling from having missed out on him a few weeks ago, and, um, and what, if he wasn't wins he again, second yeah. at that DP World Tour Championship at the end of last year. Yeah, well, that was oh, the, the one where course. he. Yeah, that, that, that was the one where he birded every single hole on the back nine. You remember yeah. that one? Yeah, yeah it was it's crazy a, run. So you know what you you know if you if you've got a tick list of what you want to see from a player going into this, and you don't want to back Rory or Tommy or Tyrrell Hatton. Yeah. I don't think that price on Matt Wallace, who in Ryder Cup year is you know bristling, confident. He's uh, he clearly won that Amiga European Masters twelfth at Wentworth. He's in decent nick, you know, and I'm not sure sort of opened the France or any of that was really the kind of courses that suited him. But I get the feeling this will. So yeah, I I don't mind a bit of Matt Wallace at um, I'm seeing prices up to thirty to one with Unibet. I won't. I won't take that naturally. I'll, t- I'll take the eight places. Uh, I've got 25 to one with Ladbrokes or Coral. Yeah. So I'll take we'll that, I think, on Matt Wallace. See, see, how, see how he puts. And, you know, ultimately, I was looking for someone with a bit more trending putting, which, mm. um, you know, but he, he, he can putt. And, you know, I've, I've been on him before when he's he's putted fantastically. And, you know, going back to that um, that performance at the Earth Course last year, for those those holes, he was absolutely incredible. So, yeah, it, it, it can all turn around and it can all turn around very quickly. Yeah, I, I should be rather disappointed if he wins, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll be pleased for you, Steve, of course. Um. The other two I've got then, uh, Jesper Svensson, I've backed at 90 to 1. Um, a long hitter who can putt. I mean, I think that's a great combination um, in what will be relatively calm conditions here this week. Second in Bahrain earlier this year. He gained over seven strokes putting on the Paspalum Greens over there in Bahrain. Uh, won the Singapore Open in March, second in Prague, fifth at the Belfry since then. And uh, it's you know, pretty much all but wrapped up his PGA Tour card for next year. Seemingly off the boil a little bit since, but he did lead going into Sunday at the Golf National. He, he shot a 76, and that derailed him. This is much more straightforward. It's, it's much less penal um, than the Golf National on a Sunday um, can be or was. So um, let's hope if he puts himself in position here, he can... Uh, he can muster a better round to finish off his tournament. And the other one I've backed is Daniel Brown, 100 to 1. Uh, I took the eight place option yesterday. He's been pushed out a little bit overnight, actually, in, in a few places with less each way terms. You can uh, you can get 150s one right now. So uh, some decent, chunky three figure options with Daniel Brown. And uh, we've said before, and said in recent weeks as well, that uh, the best work he's done this season has come in on either links or linksy, links-like or coastal affairs this this season. So coming back to something that's described and looks a bit like a bit like a links, probably not a bad shout for Dan Brown. Fourth at St Francis, links back at the SDC Championship earlier in the year. Tenth at the Open, as we said, we've talked about his performance at Troon at uh, at length. Fourth at the Irish Open when. We were on board him at a huge each way price. 
and then third last time out to out at the Andalusia Masters, which isn't too far away from the coast. So there's uh, there's plenty to like there. Uh, the numbers from that last effort actually in Soto Grande uh, are worth mentioning because he was first for strokes gained tee to green, eighth off the tee, fifth for approach, seventh for around the green. The putter was just a little bit cold, but we know he can putt. So if his long game or the rest of his game is in that kind of nick, then he could be the dark horse this week he turned 30 last month just a few weeks ago and that kind of um, that benchmark that it often galvanizes a player similar to uh, to the way that having a first child can so a uh, you know perhaps a, a newly focused daniel brown could uh, spring a surprise this week but that's mine brown svensson ollison hoygaard any final ones from either of you two guys before we move on I'm copying your homework again on Brown. I mean, after seeing what he did at Andalusia, <clears throat> that we, you know, kind of maybe ticked him as not just a link specialist, but maybe once he gets some salt in the air, in his nostrils, that you know, coastal golf courses. So, mm. um, I couldn't resist 150 to one seven places. Nice. Uh, again, you know, the, the, some of these players, because there's been quite a bit of focus on the players at the top of the market, particularly from a betting perspective, some of these guys further down are just being pushed out. And yeah, the, the option there for a player who could quite reasonably, you know, he's got two top fours what, in his last five starts. So the guy's playing well. And uh, this assignment would seem to suit. It's um, yeah, not, not one that I could leave alone, Barry. And uh, clearly you, you couldn't leave him either. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything other from you, Steve? No, I'm going to stick to those two, mate. Cool. I'll stick to those two. I, I'm, I've got enough mon- uh, loss-making players over in uh, Mexico this week, so uh, <laughs> I'll stick to the two. It's good to see um, such a decent end to the DP World Tour over the next two weeks. You know, high level, high quality field. So uh, I think that's that's good. What? Just your thoughts before we move on in terms of just the scheduling this year, Paul, on the DP World Tour as, as our expert. How have you found the tour overall? Just the way that it's been structured, the amount of elite players at events and, and the close to have you have, 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 have you seen it as a a better year than say last year just overall no not really I what frustrates me the most about the DP World Tour is it's very stop start yeah um, and that doesn't allow players or punters to build up any momentum and you know, it might sound like an excuse for, for some, some poor weeks, which it probably is. But there's, um, I, I think you need some continuity to be able to um, to, to understand how players are performing and, uh, and and to jump on at the right point. And when you kind of have two weeks on and then a week off, and then um, then you get a week where there's players coming in from the PGA Tour who are dominating a, a, a tournament, and your regular players are kind of having to take a back seat. It, it can be a bit, um, bit piecemeal, a bit, bit hit and miss with the, uh, with the tournaments. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you in the way that it finishes. I think the, you know, this latter end of the season, from yeah. kind of August onwards, is always to a championship the, in the states. Yeah, it's you can't once once you get into that stretch where you're getting Cranstall Sierra and you're getting the Irish Open, you're getting the the um, Wentworth. The, mm the French Open and then of course this um, and I think it's a great move to put two consecutive uh, tournaments out in the Middle East to complete the year as well it makes much more sense we used to have Dubai um, you know, a second Dubai event and then uh, moving on to Dubai um, as one of the options out there from previous years and it makes much more sense doing it this way I think rather than hopping about all around the uh, all around the globe but uh, yeah, no. Looking forward to this week. Looking forward to next as well. Right, Worldwide Technology Championship, PGA Tour Full Series. Now, this was the event that they always used to play at El Chameleon, which I believe is the other coastline of Mexico. Big old, big old country. Um, that was a short coastal. 6,800 yard par 71. Uh, Very small, very accuracy based golf course. And then Liv came along 
and El Chameleon and the owners of that golf course signed a rather ex- multi-million dollar deal with Live to host an event in Mexico. So the PJ Tour and the tournament organisers had to find another venue for this and they came up with El Cardinal at Diamante, which is in Cabo, in Mexico. So if you're looking on the map, it's basically the Mexican end of the Californian Peninsula, right at the very tip. So uh, very, very popular with American tourists. And this golf course is a Tiger Woods design. It was his first ever golf course that he designed back in 2014. And we had one renewal last year. You may remember it. Eric Van Ruen won an emotional victory over... I mean, it was a crazy leaderboard. I think at one point, Matt Kuchar was about six clear on the Saturday. And he'd shot something crazy like eight or nine under on the front nine and then just started falling about, falling apart coming down the stretch on Saturday afternoon. Um, and all of a sudden there was a contest on. And in the end, it was Eric that won the tournament at 27 under par. So, resort-style golf course. Yeah, this is a this is a golf course for tourists and for leisure golfers. Um, from what I'm seeing in the weather forecast, there will be no difference this year. There is very little wind. Uh, there's been plenty of rain in early October, so you might get a tiny bit of cut on the golf course, but they're just going to water the greens anyway. It is platinum paspalum throughout. Uh, acres of fairway, almost 100 acres of fairway, which tells you that the fairways this week are 60 to 70 yards wide. So it, it reminds me a little bit of what we saw a few weeks ago up in um, Utah, the Black Desert. Mm. Now that week, again, 60, 70, even 100 yards wide, some of the fairways. they do. The PJ Tour does like a habit now of coming to golf courses that are absolutely uh, there for the taking, Barry, but we won't go down that route um, at this time of year. But this isn't a challenge off the tee. We were seeing last year percentages in the 90s of fairways hit. And, you know, I've got some player references here from Van Roy, and I've also got some here from Matt Kuchar, both saying, this is Kuchar, it's a second shot golf course. Simple as that. So strokes gained approach is the metric. Uh, Eric Van Royen said, The course matches me great. I'm a great iron player. Like I said, the fairways are wide, so everyone's going to be hitting all of them. It's a second shot golf course. Um, I like the golf course in terms of the way it looks. It reminds me of a little bit of the plantation course at Kapalua. The reason I say that is that golf course where they played a century, the opening event of the PJ Tour each and every year, that golf course is wide, but it's also got plenty of undulation, and this is the same. I think they're talking uh, from top to bottom. Uh, there's, a, there's a stretch here where there's a 240 feet change in elevation. So, you know, set on a hill... Some hill, some some holes are down, some are up. Very much a plantation kind of feel. The the opening century tournament they play uh, in January, and also the only thing of note for me is it's set by the coast, but I wouldn't classify it as a coastal golf course. But for all of the holes that are going down the hill, the players are just getting this beautiful vista of the Pacific Ocean. It's more to me of a desert golf course because when you are missing, there is no rough on this golf course again. This is very black desert. It's from a few weeks ago. No rough at all. But if you are missing fairways, you are effectively landing in desert scrub. So there's cacti, verde trees. uh, There's desert arroyos that kind of dried out um, streams that, that either cut through or along each side of the golf of of the fairways. So if you are missing fairways, 
you can be in deep trouble. But you've got to be very, very errant to be in that kind of situation. Although, I mentioned Matt Kuchar's kind of meltdown on the back nine on Saturday. He started missing fairways. And yeah, he was finding himself in some very difficult situations to recover from. So he was throwing in doubles on a couple of holes where, you know, on holes where others were making birdie. And on these on this on these scoring tests where you you need to be approaching thirty under par, double bogeys are very, very damaging. So total driving like that, I don't think you have to be overly long off the tee, but it, clearly it's an advantage if you're straight. But for me, I've really hunkered down on strokes gained approach. And if you look at my eight tournament metrics, um, I'll just take you through the top 10 of what we, who we've got in this field. Uh, 10, Chapel, Highsmith, Piercy. 9, Kuchar. 8, Lanto Griffin. 7, Patton Kazire. 6, Austin Smotherman. 5, Doug Gim. 3, Nick Hardy with Michael Kim. Two Max Grazeman and number one Lucas Glover. So in my rankings, the best with their irons over the last eight tournament stretch in this field. When I actually looked at those that did well on this tour in this tournament last year, a lot of them were in my top twenty-five on strokes gained approach number. So we'll see if that carries through this year. Anything to add before we go into the selections? Any memories from last year, or or is it all? No, well, I think it's just one of these where you're just going to have to put lights out if you're going to get to that kind of level of level of scoring. Mm. So, um, you know, as, as you say, the approach play has got to be fantastic. You've either got to be knocking it absolutely stone dead most of the time, or holding your fair share of putts. I didn't, what did you say? Twenty-seven under it was for Van Roy, and so it was made thirty plus birdies in the week. So you, you know, you've got to see that ball finding the bottom of the cup with a lot of regularity. The greens here are huge, eight thousand four hundred square feet, mm. and. Even though Van Royen ranked, I think he, there was no strokes gained here. Interesting enough, we had strokes gained in um, Japan, didn't we? So I'm, I'm hopeful yep. that we get strokes gained this week, which will clearly help us when we come to the 2025 renewal next year, because they have signed a long contract for this event. So we're going to be seeing this course ongoing. Van Royen was 13th for greens in regulation and he hit 86.1% greens in regulation. So there was another 12 players better. So virtually in the nine, uh, eight, in the low 90s. So hitting yep. greens is not an issue this week. He's hitting it close and making putts. Yep. Just to back you up, Paul, on your stat, Eric Van Royen hit three eagles and 27 birdies last year. A 44% birdie or better conversion rate. That is crazy. That is mad. Four bogeys, one double. And interesting enough, Kuchar and Van Royen both ranked in the sort of top 30 for strokes game putting on my eight-week metrics going in. So if we can find players that are hitting it close and actually making some putts... Mm. I don't think that's a bad strategy this uh, this week at all. Yep. Team no part, I don't think, is going to get the job done. Now, that will make people laugh because, clearly, anyone that listens to this regular will know that I'm about to put Lucas Glover up. Stroke's gained approach in my eight tournament rankings. He's first. He's second for tee to green. The interesting point of note here is in the top 25 for strokes gained putting as well. And as 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 people that watched him at the Black Desert, as we you know, as you do intently, couldn't make a part Thursday, couldn't make a part Friday, couldn't make a part Saturday. But lo and behold, on Sunday he gained over three strokes with the putter and shot nine under par. So you just don't know what you're going to get. He has got past par and form. He's had a fifth at uh, El Chameleon a few years ago. 
we know from the fact that you know just looking at um, his history his first ever and only corn ferry uh, win was in the desert in utah and he's got a great record at places like tpc smotherlin on a golf course where i don't think outright power is a hundred percent essential we're talking about someone that can make birdies hit approach shots extremely close and has that ability to make a few putts Currently, I don't think Lucas Glover was a bad bet. I managed to get 25 to 1. One thing I will note, all of my um, tips and all of my backs yesterday on first show, which was around about 1 o'clock on Monday in the UK, were with William Hill and they were 8 places each way. Overnight, for some reason, they've gone from 8 places each way to 6 places each way. (laughs) Andy. And don't now, you think they're going to do you think they're only going to pay out on six, Steve, when you have a couple of lads finishing seventh and eighth? Well, we'll find out. That well, you might not finish tied ninth, but it's an interesting it's an interesting thing, isn't it? That as we know, that uh, William Hill and Trevor Eight Sport are now the same business. Um, the golf trader tends to work on both, and I'm seeing absolutely one hundred percent tally between Trevor Eight Sports odds and William Hill's odds. William Hill have been cut to six places each way and Treble 8 Sport are currently at eight places each way. So whether it's a temporary thing or an odds checker thing, I've been to the William Hill website this morning early and they are stating six places each way. But Paul will back me up because he, he eyeballed them as well. Mm. When we placed the bets on Monday, they were eight places each way because basically they were offering the best prices for us. So, you know, we I put up everyone with William Hill and backed with William Hill. So... That's where I just don't want people being disingenuous saying, oh, Steve, you're quoting all eight places each way, but actually there's six. That was a thing that happened either Monday evening or early Tuesday morning. It certainly wasn't that case when we were putting all this content together. Bizarre, isn't it? Very strange, but we've seen this kind of stuff before, haven't we? Where, especially with William Hill, they usually go six places each way early and then switch to eight places each way when a lot of the sharpies have disappeared. So what can you do? Hmm. Very odd. Can I just back you up on Glover? Because I've I've um I've backed him as well. We were You're just in. talking about the um the ability to knock it close. Um, Lucas Glover currently sits third for the season for proximity to hole. Wow. So in terms of his um physically getting the ball as close as possible to the hole. Joel Damon's first, Scotty Scheffler, won't surprise you, is second, Lucas Glover third. So um, I also think he's he's moved from this kind of poor putter category to what I'd class now as a streaky putter. And that was um, evident from the numbers you read through before in his last start where it was kind of poor, 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 outstanding for the final round. And um, Just explodes. Yeah, absolutely. And he has proven you know, in, in the recent past that he can put together two, three, even four putting rounds and uh, and certainly go very deep, very low in a tournament. So, so He did yeah. play here last year. He was 59th. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter was 12 months ago, this was his, he'd basically gone into hibernation because, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd qualified for the Tour Championship where he finished 20th. So he didn't need to, need to play any of these fall events. He played this, finished 59th, made the cut. So he's got course experience. The other thing I love about Lucas Glover is he's 47th in the world right now. And we you know, we were talking about this with Nikolai Hoygaard. Big week this week, he's getting his 2025 Masters invite pre-Christmas. Mm. And that's a big deal for these players, especially someone of Lucas Glover's vintage to be playing at the Masters. is a big, big deal. So I think there's a lot of motivating factors. And we saw with Glover last year when he won the Wyndham, he'd literally strung together, three, uh, I think there was three consecutive top seven finishes with low birdie total, you know, with low scoring events. And then eventually he won the Wyndham. He's that kind of player. He's a Ricky Fowler sort where he doesn't win from nothing. You have to see something before he actually wins at a, at a lower odds price. That's just Glover. So yeah, I, I, I'm I'm very I'm very keen on Lucas Glover. And actually, you look at the market this week, boys. I don't know what you thought about it. You know, clearly you got Max Grazeman favourite. Well, Max Grazeman's probably been never favourite in a golf tournament in his life, and he's never actually won a professional title. Cam Young hasn't played since the BMW Championship, 
And then it's just, you know, the bookmakers basically, it's take your pick, isn't it? They've thrown everyone in at this 25 to 1 to 33 to 1 price point. Mm. They don't know, do they? They don't know. You know, Taylor Moore, Tom Hoagie, Jonathan Vegas, Harris English, Keith Mitchell, Sam Stevens, Matt Kuchar, they're all, Harry Hall, great Nick, Matty Schmidt, never won. All in at the same price. Bo Hosler, Maverick McNeely, good luck backing him at 28 to 1. JJ Spawn, Ben Griffin, they're all in there at this price point. The same as Lucas Glover. The difference with Lucas Glover is he's a major champion and he can actually win golf tournaments. So that's where I came to it from. Hmm. In that same price point, I've also gone for a player that for me is just starting to trend. And you see this sometimes. He was an amazing amateur. Uh, he finished runner-up in the 2017 US Amateur, played at Riviera Country Club. He won the 2018 coveted Ben Hogan Award as an amateur. Then he became pro at the end of 2018. Uh, played Corn Ferry in 2019, graduated in the first season. Then he came to the PJ Tour. And it's been slow going for him. It has been slow going for him. He's now 28, hasn't won an event yet. But you just look at his numbers... So far in 2024 on the PGA Tour, he ranks 11th for T to green. 11th for T to green, and he's sixth for strokes gained on approach. The only two in this field with better strokes gained approach numbers across the whole year, Tom Hoagie, Lucas Glover. And the thing I noted the other week, and I know it was his home course, I know he lives in Las Vegas, he was second at the Shriners Children's Open, and he was in the final group, and he shot a 6-under 65 on Sunday. Didn't collapse, played great golf, just got beaten on the day by JT Poster. That, for me, is a big mental hurdle for someone like Doug Gim to, oh, you know, I'm contending in a PGA Tour event, I'm there on Sunday, the glare of all the cameras, the big, the big the crowd, everything, and he performed, and he finished second. I think he can take that on. I really do. He's got quite... F- Quite quiet, but fairly significant desert golf form. PJ West 5th, TPC Scottsdale 12th, TPC Summerlin, of course, runner-up the other week. And he was 15th here last year at El Cardinal. If we get a positive putting week out of Doug Gim, again, I think he's the sort that can pull together a low total and potentially win his first maiden PGA Tour victory this week. So 25-1 to with Gim. And I've got 25 to 1 on Lucas Glover. Two points each way on both of those. Uh, Any of you... My next uh, selection is 60 to 1. So if you guys want to chime in with your selection, sub 60 to 1, if you've got any, please do. Only one for me was Lucas Glover. So um, 80 to 1 beyond that for me. You're not going for Bo Hosler? I thought you were going to go for Bo this week, Paul. No, no. I'll, I'll leave him for Barry. No, um, I, <clears throat> you know he has been popping quite a lot recently, so tempting. But then you see the odds, and I don't know, price proud. So I'm going to be price proud this week. I just don't really? feel compelled. To, I thought yeah, you'd I got feel, over that. I thought you said that, you know nowadays you you just hold your nose and and back them. Yeah, but I don't feel compe- I didn't feel compelled to back them anyway. So no, exactly. Um, when when you see <laughs> I- that combo of. <laughs> price with you're you're not you know you don't have the urgency to back them so you know no. then there's the exception to the rule so no I'm just gone fishing in deeper waters this week see can I land something big so how how deep are you talking what's your opening price my first one is Carson Young at eighty to one well you might as well talk the talk the listeners through it yeah um don't really know exactly how I got to it but <clears throat> kind of wanted the name first and then needed the rationale behind rather than the other way around um but the one the one that picked kind of clicked for me was he's got good overall stats um and then the one that kind of pushed it over the edge and kind of uh gave me the nudge to back him was he's 11th in proximity this year Mm. so i liked that merge with the price I just wanted a, somebody with that mid to high level price and a couple of half decent stats behind it just for a fun bet for the week. Don't want to get too serious on this because the kind of yeah, 
yes, guys are trying to do certain things, but there's also kind of a s- slow switching off vibe happening as well. No matter how much intensity somebody wants to bring to it, you know, you're after Halloween, you're heading towards Christmas, you've had a long year. So it's kind of hard to find full motivation throughout the the field. Or that's what it feels like anyway. I, I could be completely wrong. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go. F- that's why I'm at the longer odds. Just try bink a couple. Eighth this year at the Mexico Amp Open at Vedanta. Love that crossover. He also finished 15th there last year, and he had a third in the Puerto Rico Open in 2023. So clearly gets on well with the pass Barlam. So, yeah, I can see... Um, I think he's kind of one fifteen ish on the FEC, so just needs a just one more half decent week to make sure that he's got his full privileges for next year. So I, I get I get Carson Young. He was on my short list. Uh, the ones I have backed, uh, I've gone for Joe Highsmith, uh, sixty to one with William Hill. Uh, I've got eight places each way. Younger sort, progressive, only turned pro in 2022. He's 126 in the FedEx Cup full series rankings. He's one spot outside grabbing a full playing card for next year. He ranks in the top 10, I believe, for stroke. I'm sorry, top three for strokes gained current form, Joe Highsmith. And that all corresponds to the fact that he changed his putting grip a few uh couple of months ago and ever since then he's actually been able to make some putts his tee to green numbers have always been good all of a sudden he's actually making putts so high smith i'm on him at 60 to 1 still needs to play well to get these full playing privileges i've also taken out this won't surprise podcast regulars even i'm sniffing around him or paul sniffing around him and i think barry's even putted him up as well Another guy that needs decent results is Henrik Norlander. He's 121st in these full series rankings. Um, getting a big, getting a full playing privileges with a big would be a huge deal for him. We know that recently, 11th at the Barracuda, 12th at the 3M, 8th at the Omega European Masters at Crans Jussier, 8th at the Black Desert Championship a few weeks ago. I've said that that Black Desert Championship, I do get a lot of feel from that course to this. Norlander does need to go well. He was 15th, uh, 13th at this year's Mexico Open, the one we just referenced for Carson Young, but he was third heading into Sunday. So again, I think Henrik Norlander's got those motivational angles and we know that his strokes gained approach game is his strength. I've got 80 to 1 on Norlander. And finally, another player that's playing really good golf in the fall this year. Again, he ranks tied third for strokes gained current form over the last eight tournaments. Wesley Bryan. I've got 125 to 1 with William Hill on the eight places on Wesley Bryan. You just look at his career. Corn Ferry, PGA Tour always starts popping up at these events that are outside of the United States. So Mexico, Panama, Colombia, Puerto Rico, Corrales this year, uh, that they play in the Dominican Republic. He's finished second there this year, behind Billy Horschel. And Brian is 144th, I think it is. Sorry, 138th in the FedEx Cup Full Series list. So... I think he'll be pleased with that. I mean, he's come from absolutely nowhere. His game's fallen apart. All of a sudden, he's got literally a realistic chance of getting full playing privileges. I think this week or next week in Bermuda, well worth sticking with someone like Wesley Bryan. So, Bryan, Norlander, Highsmith, Gim and Glover for me. Over to you two to just finish off. Um, yeah, I, I like your shout on Norlander. Um, I backed him two at eighty to one. The other one I've backed is Nate Lashley again at eighty yeah. to one. He's got some progressive form: sixty first at the Black Desert, 29th ninth Shrine, as sixteenth at the Zozo. And what I like is that there's been some sparky rounds in there as well. A couple of sixty fives at the Shriners, sixty six, yeah. sixty three at the Zozo, tenth here last year. So. Um, he won the Rocket Mortgage Classic at 25 under back in 2019, so we know he can go deep enough to contend here. So, so yeah, thoughts, another uh, on my eight. shortlist. 
Nate Lashley. Yeah. He's he's a bit like Bryce Garnett. He's one of these Mister Paspalum guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lo- I do yeah. like Nate Lashley. Barry, over one. Barry, over to you yeah. to finish. Any I'm more? With you. I'm, we- I'm Wesley Bryan as well. Are you? Yeah, he's a great wedge player. So you know, the irons are yeah one of his strengths. So like, let's go this week. Loves performing on the kind of the coastal, let's say the holiday vibe courses. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was well, he was twenty first in the Black Desert Championship. I think it was. Hang on, a couple of weeks ago. That's right. Yeah. T- if you actually look, so, Barry, but he, if you he actually terrible look at first his, round. If you look at his fifty four hole scoring for that exactly sixty five, sixty seven, sixty six. He needed to start faster. He's seventy two round one when you know Matt McCarthy goes out with a sixty two. So mm. yeah, yeah. So yeah, the other thing that grabs me with Brian is he's eighth in my strokes going off the T metric over the last eight tournaments. Now that's for a guy that's a short, relatively short hitter, but all of a sudden he seems to be hitting it longer and hitting it straight. And as you say, for for a player that's renowned for his wedge game and his putting, mm-hmm. I think that's a that's a really good sign. Yeah, if that so, putter yeah. lights up from, I could can't be remember the week. last time I put Wesley Bryan up. So it's <laughs> it's nice to be able to do so. Right, I hope your bets go well, gentlemen. Yeah, best of luck, guys. You too, guys. Best of luck to listeners. Um, we will be back next week for the DP World Tour Championship finale at the Earth Course, and on the PGA Tour, we've got the Butterfield Bermuda Championship, where I expect. I'll be bemoaning the fact that Wesley Bryan missed the cut and he's bound to win. (laughs) I hope your bets go well. We'll see you again next week. Don't forget, press that five-star button on Spotify and send us your five-star review. See you soon. If you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved all the stats and the tips and so much more cause it's the golf betting system the golf